Good morning, everyone. Um, today, my presentation is uh, going to talk about homelessness and the relationship it has on a person's health, um, focusing on women's health. To begin, I just wanted to talk about why I chose this topic. Um, I grew up in a small town in Montana, and um, homelessness wasn't really an issue that I was faced with until my older brother became homeless. Um, so my older brother is an adventurous lad, and at the age of 19, he decided he was going to move to Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, he dreamed of getting an exciting job on the Strip and making that his home. Um, when he got there, he immediately started applying for jobs, realized that you have to be 21 years of age, which he was not. Um, and he only had a little bit of money, a few clothes, and so he didn't have any place to stay. The first two days, he ended up roaming up and down the strip and riding buses because he knew it'd be safe. And then eventually, after two days of not sleeping, realized he had to find a place where he could sleep without getting in trouble. He asked around and realized there was a homeless population north of the strip that lived in a parking garage. And so he made that his home for about two weeks. He eventually um, moved to a staircase uh, by a church and then gave up and went home. Um, you know, when he was talking about his time there, a few things that really stood out was, one, once you um, are homeless, uh, you don't have an address, you don't have a phone, and you don't have clean clothes. So it made it incredibly difficult to find a job even after he started looking elsewhere outside of the Strip. The other thing that really impressed upon me is just the living situation that he was in. Um, he, you know, it sounded terrifying at times. There was a high prevalence of violence as well as drug use. And so while his um, episode of homelessness was pretty short, relatively speaking, it really opened my eyes to some of the challenges that those experiencing homelessness have and um, kind of motivated me to work with that population. So in med school, I had the opportunity of working with a student-run clinic for the homeless, and um, I was the clinic coordinator and volunteer there. Um, for my first two years, and then the fourth year, they have a month-long rotation focused on street medicine. Um, that experience really exposed me to some of the challenges that we as healthcare providers have of providing good care, as well as some of the unique issues that people who experiencing homelessness have of staying healthy. So this is my brother and his lovely wife, Samaris. He now lives in Puerto Rico. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. So today I'm going to talk first about the history of homelessness in America, and then talk about uh, the definitions of homelessness as well as some of the prevalence both nationally and locally, um, and then move on to talk about some of the intersections that um, healthcare has with homelessness and vice versa, as well as some interventions and local resources that we have in our community. So I think it's important to talk about the history of homelessness because it kind of um, starts to give you a perspective of some of the causes of homelessness, as well as the trends and why some populations are overrepresented. So America has a long history of homelessness all the way back into the 1600s. Um, in the 1600s, being homeless was kind of seen as a, a moral deficiency. Uh, so in a lot of communities, um, if you were a good Christian, God would provide a home and food for you. Um, so there's a very negative connotation. Um, most people who were homeless were displaced from things like wars. So there's the King Philip War in the 1600s and the American Revolutionary War um, in the 1700s. Um, moving into the 1800s, we started to see a hierarchy within the population as far as the public perception. So the, um, the kind of top on the list was hobos, and there was almost a romanticized perception, and you can see it in some of the literature, of um, a young man wandering or riding the railroads in search for um, jobs. A tramp was someone who also wandered around looking for work, but um, resorted to begging. And then lowest on the podium pole was a uh, vagrant. And those were individuals who were homeless, uh, but resorted to thievery um, or other um, uh, law issues. In the 1800s, there was um, 
also an increase of movement from farms into the city due to economic hardships. And so the city started seeing an influx in the amount of the homeless population. This prompted um, private citizens to start making um, charities, uh, soup kitchens, shelters, um, but the government tended to lag behind on helping individuals who are homeless. In fact, some areas like New York uh, made laws where it heavily fined anyone who was begging on the streets. Of course, the Civil War had a large impact on the homeless population. Um, a lot of individuals were without housing and without jobs. After the Civil War provides one of the root causes for why there's a long history of um, minority populations having higher rates of homelessness. Um, the, there's about 4 million slaves who were freed, and they were often um, termed freedmen. And so the government uh, made a bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau, to try to um, get these individuals into the society while still preserving the economy, especially at the South. Um, so they tried to get um, the freedmen into the plantation work with wages and with the opportunity to work out of the working class. There was also um, a movement to try to get them 40 acres and a mule, which basically gave land to those individuals who were freed. Unfortunately, that fell short, and only about 1% of uh, the freed slaves actually got uh, 40 acres. And in this time, um, homes and land was oftentimes passed on generation to generation. And so with so many individuals who did not have a home or land, um, it led to um, generations of uh, um, home instability as well as homelessness. Into the um, late 1800s and 1900s, it was still a negative connotation within um, the public perception, and um, some terms that were pretty negative were down and outs and bums. Um, the uh, Late 1800s also was an example of how um, natural disaster, disasters can affect um, homelessness. So in total, about 1.3 million people were displaced, and this was due to several different reasons. One was the Great uh, Chicago Fire, and the other was the San Francisco earthquake. There was also massive flooding of the Mississippi River, which really affected people all the way from Ohio down to New Orleans. Um, in more modern day terms, we saw this after things like Hurricane Katrina. Um, so even seven years after the hurricane hit, um, the homeless um, population is 2.5 times higher than it was before Hurricane Katrina hit. And of course, we can't talk about um, the history without talking about the Great Depression. Um, the Great Depression demonstrates the impact the economy has on homelessness. Um, when the stock market crashed in 1929, um, unemployment rates soared up to 25%. And so we saw a large increase in homeless families. So this was kind of a shift before we mostly saw men who were homeless. And now we were seeing whole families and children who were homeless. Um, there was a loss of uh, factory works. There was also the great drought within the Midwest. And we had people moving um, to the coast to try to find work. Um, all in all, uh, the homeless population was estimated at 200,000 to 1.5 million throughout those years. Oftentimes, families would double up with other families and live in very close quarters. The other um, area that people often moved to were these shanty towns, which were called Hoovervilles. <clears throat> um, FDR's New Deal was one of the first government programs that really tried to help people get jobs and to get homes, and in a lot of ways it did a lot of good. Um, however, it was uh, more prevalently helpful for those who were white. Um, so part of the program was to get government loans to get houses, and 98% of those went to white citizens. Um, in the 1980s, we also saw an increase in homelessness, and this was due to several different factors. Um, one was there was a large closing of psychiatric facilities uh, without an increase in mental health communi um, community services. Um, there was a, also a rise of the crack cocaine epidemic. Many factories were closing, um, and there was a reform on welfare um, policies. Uh, 
But finally, in the 2000s, we had some good news. We had a decrease in homelessness, a total of 17%. Um, this was largely due to a decrease in the uh, family homelessness as well as the chronically homeless. This was mostly attributed to specific initiatives um, by the government. So George W. Bush took a somewhat revolutionary approach uh, to tackling homelessness, and the primary goal was to get someone into housing first and then start to deal with some other issues like mental health. This re um, uh, resulted in a 30% reduction in homelessness. And in 2009, despite being in the heart of the Great Recession, um, homeless uh, populations continued to decrease because of aggressive spending uh, promoted by the Obama administration in tackling homelessness and to keep people in their homes. 2017 was the first time that we saw an increase again in the um, homeless population um, since the Great Recession. And today, there's about half a million people on any given night who are either on the streets or in shelters. So a lot of this um, is it's somewhat surprising because 2017 was a strong year for our economy. Um, but a few of the big issues is the um, hourly wage has been really stagnant since the 1970s. So if you look at the um, average median wage from 1973, this is in 2016 dollars, it's 16.74, and in 2016 it's only 17.86. So it's only gone up one dollar, whereas housing has gone up astronomical. Um, today, if you live in New York or Los Angeles, for example, you would need an average medium wage of 27 or 23 dollars um, per hour. So when we think of homelessness, um, there are structural um, issues that can cause it as well as individual issues. And some of the structural ones are ones that we talked about, so the economy, um, job opportunity, uh, affordable housing, and then also what's going on in the environment. Individual struct uh, structural factors are um, things like a history of violence or abuse, being involved in the criminal justice system, and then health issues, either mental or physical. Um, in young people, um, there's high rates of being uh, victimization, being in a non-heterosexual identity, and the child welfare system. All right, so this is how the government defines homelessness. It's a long definition, so I've broken it down. Um, basically, it's a person who lacks housing. Um, this can include those individuals who are sheltered, um, either a private or a public shelter, um, or can be considered homeless if they are in a transitional housing. You can be considered homeless um, if you're doubled up, and so we talked about this earlier as with I lost my house and had to move in with someone else. Um, you can also consider those um, previously homeless who have been um, either in the jail or the hospital and have no place to go afterwards. Um, so there's three different patterns of homelessness, and um, it's the crisis or transitional is kind of the first shortest time period. So these are individuals who have been homeless once or twice and in a relatively short amount of time, so usually less than a year. So when my brother was homeless, he would be considered either a crisis or transitional pattern. Intermittent homelessness are individuals who cycle in and out of homelessness, alternating between housing or the hospital. And then finally, chronic homelessness are those individuals um, with disabilities who are homeless for at least a year or have had four episodes of homelessness in three years. Uh, these individuals, of course, have worse health outcomes. And risk factors for becoming chronically um, homeless are mental health issues, substance issues, and a history of criminal, um, a, a criminal justice system. So let's talk about in the nation um, what the statistics are. So um, in the United States, three million persons are experiencing homelessness. About a third of those are women, as well as families. Um, there is an overrepresentation of minority populations, including um, African Americans and Native Americans. Uh, so uh, African Americans make up 12% of the total population in our country, but they make up to about 40% of those individuals in shelter populations. So this is from um, the uh, 
national data, and it just shows the difference in trends from 2007 and 2017. Overall, we do see a decrease um, in pretty much all populations except for those individuals experiencing homelessness in major cities that are unsheltered, and that is the dark green line that's veering up. This just gives you a nice visual, I'm kind of a visual person, on what the makeup is um, in the nation. So it's pretty evenly distributed between sheltered and unsheltered individuals, as well as families. Luckily, uh, those families who are homeless um, and are unsheltered only makes up 3%. So this data looks at um, between 2016 and in 2017, overall we saw a 12% increase in those individuals experience chronic homelessness. Um, we did see a decrease in families and children, though. I just wanted to include this slide because um, this gives the largest number of people experiencing homelessness across the nation, and they break it up into major cities, which is on the far um, right, and then states. And Wisconsin does make that list of one of the higher uh, percentages. All right, so switching gears a little bit, so Dane County. Um, in 2013, we saw about 3,000 individuals on any given night um, in a shelter. So these aren't counting the people on the streets. We see similar makeup as far as percentages of men and women and families. So about a third of them are women. And I wanted to give this slide. It's the racial makeup um, of Dane County, and it kind of goes to what uh, our previous speaker was talking about, but we're a predominantly white uh, county. So 85% of individuals are white. However, when you look at Dane County individuals in the shelter population, uh, we see that most, about half of them are African American. So the green represents um, African American population, the blue is white. And then um, even more striking is the amount of um, homeless families that are African American. So the large majority are. If you live in Wisconsin and you are white, you have a one in 416 chance of, being, of experiencing homelessness compared to one in 36 if you are black. And if you're American Indian or multiracial, you have six times more likely to experience homelessness. So we'll now talk about some of the intersections between homelessness and health. Um, there's been studies that show there's kind of three big areas that are affected. One is that health problems can contribute to becoming homeless. Homelessness can um, affect a person's health and cause health problems. And homelessness can really interfere with our treatment of um, illnesses. Disabilities can lead to people having difficulties finding jobs, as well as housing, especially affordable housing that is appropriate for their needs. And so we do see a higher percentage of individuals who have disabilities in the homeless population, up to 55%. Um, there's uh, mental health issues and substance abuse issues are high causes of um, homelessness. And in women, 25 to 25, 25 to 50 percent of women and children become homeless as a direct result of domestic violence. I thought this was really interesting data. In Massachusetts and Ohio, 27 and 36 percent of people who were released from a psychiatric hospital um, became homeless within the six months of release. So we can see a direct correlation between mental health and becoming homeless. There's been multiple studies looking at um, mortality. And across the boards, we see an increase in mortality in those experiencing homelessness. On average, um, people live about 17 years less than those in the general population. And in general, we see a bimodal distribution. So um, an increase in mortality in those who are young, and this is primarily due to external causes. Um, so some of those would include homicide, suicide, um, accidental overdose um, or trauma, and uh, elderly individuals, it's more due to chronic problems. And so we see uh, chronic illnesses that are usually um, the morbidity and mortality um, we see 15 years earlier than what we see in the general population. 
This is data from a study that was done in Poland, and it gives the average aid life expectancy of males and females in the general population compared to um, the homeless population. And as you can see, there's a big difference in those ages, and it's particularly um, increased in females. So other studies have confirmed this, that being female actually increases your mortality if you are homeless. Other factors include being homeless for more than five years, having served in the military, um, and having been um, previously incarcerated or unsheltered. Infectious diseases is also a large problem. Um, these are just some of the infectious diseases that are increased. Um, in the general population, pretty much all the ones listed above are less than 1%. And in the homeless population, it can be anywhere, you know, from kind of low 4% up into uh, the 50%. You can see that there's a large range of um, percentages, and this has to do with some of the heterogeneity in the studies. So it depends a lot on where the studies is done, which ones have higher prevalences. But for example, tuberculosis in, in the general population um, compared to the homeless population is about 20 times higher. Age-related conditions, as I mentioned earlier, are seen at an earlier age, anywhere from 10 to 15 years. And so we see higher rates of functional impairments as well as cognitive impairments, higher rates of falls and urinary incontinence. We also see an increased risk of morbidity and mortality from cardiovascular diseases. And this has to do with a lot of um, the behavioral risk factors, including smoking and drug use, lack of poor nutrition, and access to care. So as you can see from this graph, um, the prevalence of things like hypertension, obesity, diabetes is actually very similar between um, those who are homeless versus those who are not. However, the rates of uh, MIs and strokes is drastically higher in those who are experiencing homelessness. I um, included Canadian data as well for those who are homeless, and I just thought it was interesting that the prevalence is much less uh, for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. Psychiatric disorders are much more prevalent um, in the homeless population, and this is probably the area that's been most studied. Um, over 30 studies have investigated psychiatric disorders um, and show a higher prevalence. Um, again, we do see a large range of, um, of percentages, um, but the one that I thought was really interesting is the dual diagnosis. That's anywhere from 58 to 65 percent. And a dual diagnosis includes individuals who have either a, a mental health issue as well as a substance abuse problem. And that's compared to less than 1% in the general population. Abuse is another large issue. So a Canadian study found that 75% of those experiencing homelessness reported at least one form of abuse. 50% of those reported sexual abuse. Women and transgendered individuals um, have higher rates of sexual assault. And those who experienced some type of abuse um, had worse psychiatric outcomes, as well as higher rates of self-harm. In homeless use, we see similar numbers. Um, so 57 reported some type of severe abuse. So that included things like beating with a fist, being threatened by a weapon. Um, and 50, up to 50% reported some type of sexual assault. And in young women, we see about 40% reporting some type of sexual abuse. Unintentional injuries are another area of concern. Um, even compared to those in um, a low socioeconomic status, uh, there's higher rates of going to the ED for things like burns. Oftentimes, this is from getting too close to a fire to stay warm, hypothermia injuries, heat exhaustion, um, as well as self-harm injuries. Traumatic brain injuries are, the prevalence is much higher than the general population. So 38 to 53 percent of individuals have had a traumatic brain injury. And studies have looked at, does, you know, does the traumatic brain injury come first or does it happen while the person is homeless? And there's actually an increase at both categories. So if you have a traumatic brain injury, you're at increased risk for becoming homeless but you're also at increased risk for staying homeless. Um, overall, in the United States, uh, tobacco use has really decreased. 
in the last 20 years, but not in the homeless population. So there's still 68 to 80 percent of individuals who smoke tobacco. That's four times higher than the general population and two and a half times higher than those in low income populations. Not only is it a higher prevalence, but we also see lower quit rates. And there's been some research to kind of look at this and decide why that is. Um, one factor is there's a um, high exposure rate in shelters. There's also um, competing factors that when individuals do go to the doctor, um, there's usually a list of medical issues that need to be addressed. And sometimes tobacco use is at the bottom of that list. Pregnancy is also affected um, and contraception. So there is um, an increased risk of um, unintended pregnancies. So in the general population, it's about 50%, a little less. And in those experiencing homelessness, it's up to 73%. Um, in youths, we see similar results. Um, so 48 of those living on the street and 33% of those living in shelters had been pregnant. Compared to their age group and people who were housed, only 7% of them were um, pregnant. There's been a lot of qualitative studies looking at women's attitudes toward pregnancy. And um, in reading through those, um, most women said they either want to become pregnant in the future or um, feel indifferent about it. But pretty much across the board, women wanted to not become pregnant while they were homeless. And the most common reason they stated for not desiring pregnancy at that time is the concern for the effects that it um, had on their child. The problem is, is contraception um, is not used much. And there's lots of lots of reasons why this is. But um, in looking at different studies, the two main um, contraceptive uh, choices that people use is either abstinence or, con uh, or condoms. So in one study, 92% of women who were using contraception if they were homeless used condoms. And only 30% of them used them every time. And then another one showed that abstinence was the most commonly um, used source of contraception. And, um, but within the last week, most of them said that they had intercourse. So um, in perinatal outcomes, um, we also see a higher rate of preterm delivery as well as um, infants weighing less than 2,000 grams as well as small for gestational age. And those individuals are 2.9 times more likely to have preterm deliveries. They're almost seven times more likely to give birth um, to infants weighing less than 2,000 grams and three times um, more likely to have small for gestational newborns. This study um, is a Canadian study and it um, compares women who are housed, who use substance use, who are homeless, and those who are homeless and use um, some type of substance. We see an increase in all three categories um, between women who are homeless as well as use um, some type of drug or alcohol. But when you combine those two risk factors, it almost doubles that rate. Um, so it's almost 40% for the um, risk of preterm birth before 37 weeks. Mental health, as we've talked about, um, is higher in those experiencing homelessness. And as we know as obstetricians, mental health can have big impacts on pregnancy. And so I just wanted to give you some of the percentages of some of the psychiatric disorders, um, but very high numbers of um, especially um, PTSD, drug and alcohol use, as well as depression. Power dynamics shift a little bit in those experiencing homelessness, and sometimes women um, use uh, trade sex for either food or shelter. And women who do this are three times more likely to experience sexual violence. Um, and there's higher rates of reproductive coercion as well as increased rates of intimate partner, partner violence. Um, not only does homelessness affect a woman's health, but it can also affect a child's health. And this study was very interesting to me. Um, it looked at psychiatric outcomes in children whose mothers um, experienced homelessness. And so on the bottom line, the blue one, um, it's the least amount of psychiatric disorders in children, are those women who were housed and had no psychiatric issues. 
those who were homeless and had a psychiatric issue, we saw a much higher prevalence of childhood illnesses. So that's um, the line that's most prevalent. We also have issues with trying to provide good care to individuals who are homeless. Um, there's a lot of barriers, and these are just a few. I don't think it um, fits on everyone. But um, transportation is a big one, and it, in some areas, it's a little bit better having better public transportation to get to the hospital, to get to clinic visits. Medication adherence, um, there's several different reasons why this is a problem. One is sometimes people can't afford uh, filling the prescription. Another is uh, that drugs, um, medications, I should say, are oftentimes stolen, um, even, the one, even ones that we wouldn't typically think about. So it's not just the oxycodones that are stolen. Um, and then also places to store them that are safe. There's also, um, oftentimes people have negative connotations with the medical um, providers or facilities um, just because of the stigma. There's a lack of appropriate documentation, so sometimes this can um, inhibit individuals from getting insurance um, or other programs. They may not have a birth certificate or a photo ID. And then competing priorities. So. This is one, you know, if a woman is homeless and has a five-year-old, she's got a list of things that she needs to figure out during the day. Where is she going to sleep? Where are they going to get food? How are they going to keep warm? And maybe going to get a pap smear is just kind of pretty low on that list. And then I found this one very challenging is um, discharge planning and follow-up. Um, so because of all the issues listed above, you know, it's hard for people to get to visits. Um, they may not have a phone um, to get results or to figure out what they need to do to follow up. Um, and you can't send them a letter necessarily unless they have some shelter that they are staying at. One national study showed that 73% of individuals who are homeless have at least one unmet health need. And that can range from anything from medical issues uh, to dental care. Treating diseases can also be challenging. I think diabetes is a good example of that. Um, so in individuals who are either living on the streets or in shelters, um, there are several different areas that is hard for them. First, if they're on insulin, oftentimes you have to store it in a refrigerator. They oftentimes don't have access to a refrigerator. Even if they're living in a shelter, um, they oftentimes have to leave the shelter during the day um, and come back at night. And so they either have to take their insulin or leave it with the risk of maybe they won't get back into the shelter that night. Syringes are oftentimes stolen for drug use. And controlling the diet can be next to impossible. Um, it's possible they don't know when their next meal is going to be, how much they're going to be able to eat, or what the quality of food is going to be. Um, barriers to contraception have um, overlap a lot with the barriers we discussed earlier. Um, but we talked kind of in the other talk, um, making patients come back for that second visit for LARCs is very challenging, as well as being able to afford them um, or get them taken out if they don't want them anymore. Um, individuals who are homeless are less likely to get pap smears, and they're more likely to have abnormal pap smears, as well as the mortality for cervical cancer is nearly six times that of the house population. You can see about only 50% of women who are homeless get their annual exams and paps. There were some studies that have um, looked at um, towns that have good screening programs. So some areas have really good you know, homeless clinics where you can get your pap for free. Um, the problem that they find is that there's a lack of follow-up. So oftentimes women um, get a pap smear, but they don't know what the result is um, because there's no way to get them that result. And so they don't actually get the proper care that they need. They don't get the colposcopy or the leap. We see similar results for mammograms. Um, so about 70% of the U.S. population gets them, whereas only 59% uh, of those experiencing homelessness get a mammogram. So what can we do as, um, as providers? Well, I think one of the first steps is to really build that relationship. 
since there is a lack of distress sometimes in this community, um, really trying to um, build a relationship and gaining the trust is really important and for buy-in, for follow-up, coming back to appointments. And then knowing some of the community resources can be beneficial. Um, being attuned that there are some of these issues that are more prevalent in this population. And then trying to think about medication regimens that will work well for individuals. Um, so maybe not serving someone on a beta blocker that if they can't refill that prescription coming off of it, you know, can have harmful effects on their health. And I think one of the most important things is to work in a multidisciplinary team. Really getting social work involved um, and getting them hooked up with if they need someone in mental health, if they need addiction medicine, and finding what their particular needs are. And then I think finally just advocacy. And that's just on an individual patient level as well as I think in a more global um, government level. Some of our resources that we have in our community, um, we have several different emergency shelters. And the primary one for women is the Salvation Army and then the YWCA for families. The Briar Patch um, runs a variety of programs to support runaway homeless youth, and they serve about 2,000 youths each year. Transitional housing, typically you can get in for a little bit longer period of time, and a few I wanted to highlight. Um, the Elizabeth House uh, is a residential maternity program, and so women who are pregnant can stay there anywhere between 6 and 12 months. And um, there they attend parenting classes, dinners, um, and they are required to either work or do some sort of volunteer work. The Holly House is for um, individuals who are over the age of 18, and they can stay up be between um, 8 and 24 months. And then the last one I wanted to highlight is the Empower House. And that is, uh, provides women uh, survivors of domestic violence with housing. So besides housing, we also have different groups that provide financial assistance as well as legal advocacy. So um, the Legal Action of Wisconsin is a legal group that helps um, individuals who get fines um, on the street um, to be waived with a community service. And so sometimes individuals get a small ticket that's like $20, but they're unable to pay it. And so this group um, uh, stops it before it becomes $20, $200, and on and on and on. And then the DIAS program um, provides legal rep representation to those experiencing domestic violence. <clears throat> There's also many medical clinics in our area. Um, I think we are all pretty familiar with Share the Health, which is a great program for those without insurance. And so individuals who do, for example, have a pap smear that's abnormal um, and can't afford a LEAP um, can go to Share the Health and get care. There's also Planned Parenthood and the Access Center. And then the medic clinics are student-run clinics here in Madison, and they have um, several different locations that kind of focus on different areas. So I'll leave you just with this quote. Um, this is a very complex issue, both the causes of homelessness as well as the interaction with um, the healthcare system and health. And I think it's just important as providers to remember that individuals are increased risk for many things, but that each one is an individual with a unique story and unique needs. These are my references. And thanks. to deal with patients that are homeless or just patients in the low socioeconomic group. So two comments. One is that I think this is a, a classic example of why the medical home is so important um, to have, when a patient comes in, have all of the social work, the you know everybody there so that they can immediately access those people if you find the need, because a physician doesn't have time. Um, and secondly, um, the, the other thing that came to mind is um, that there are luckily starting to be some um, computer 
generated easy sites to go to. There's, a, I know there's somebody here in town that's working on it, where basically if you, if a patient comes into ER or urgent care, that physician or nurse can literally go to that site and say what the problem is and find out where, which site is closest to where they are currently at and which site has the availability for the thing that they need. So for example, patient needs diapers, all right? Maybe this site is out of diapers, but that site isn't. So that you can actually help people immediately. And I think that would be, what will be wonderful is all these brilliant computer people come up with more and more of those things that are just built into the system that you're using, which would be very helpful and doesn't take as much time. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of the studies were controlled for most of those factors, and the big ones were things like um, socioeconomics and then substance tobacco use, as well as um, kind of larger um, health issues. Mm -hmm. What sort of resources exist in Jane County to help these people um, get access to the mental health services they need? Um, mental health is always, you know, nationally and locally kind of an issue. Um, but, you know, they do, with social work can kind of get them hooked into things like journey and that sort of thing. Um, some of the shelter, or not shelters, but transitional homes do have some mental health components to them. There's also, and I think someone to, came to talk to us about, um, you can do e-consults for mental health as like a primary care provider um, if you need to pr prescribe some medication. But unfortunately, there's not too many resources. Although you definitely just pointed out 